for Christine Peters, our luncheon chairperson. What a great job she has. And here we introduce our keynote speaker, a grand dame of New Hampshire. It's Christine Peters, who will introduce the best of the show. Good afternoon. No introduction for most of us in this room. Ooh. I came into the Federation when my first child was born, and I stayed home with him and had a lot of time on my hands. So it's been just about my career 20 years for me. And it didn't take me very long to meet Joseph and Augusta and, um, and, and to see them attend many of my lab functions together and have the opportunity to, uh, our son is going to speak. When we used to put real lilacs and mason jars out in the hallway, Mr. Patron or our master Patron, he would oversee that and he would <laughs> help me to adjust the blossoms while our little girls ran around and he would tell them um, stories about his mother canning jam in the same jars. Um, so it's exciting to have our girls here still. Um, and one of the things um, that is looking over this biography that you all have in a very tiny print in your program, because even in that print, there's still far more we can say. Um, but thing, something that stands out to me is her lifelong faithfulness, first as a wife, and, and um, really fulfilling that role, I think, the way it was designed to be fulfilled as a, a help meet for every situation. And then um, using her extra time, always investing in young people. So I was that young person, and now I'm not so a young person. <laughs> um, but just from, from leading Girl Scouts, or teaching English or French, um, uh, being a private tutor, just everywhere she went, she found a way. Um, and I especially love that line that she had organized a costume group of writing supporters that campaigned for the future president. They grew to 150 Duchess Dollies. And that doesn't surprise me a bit if you all remember the Mamas for Mid. And are there any Mamas for Mid here? <laughs> and so, just without any further um, words, I want to welcome Mrs. Augusta Patron to come and share some of her highlights with you today. Boss 
Boston Community Church. Oh. 
they all go to the forest in South Carolina. Well, a year went by, two years, and we suddenly moved back in the big city, we were in the Washington area, and um, we had a royal greeting to Alexandria, Virginia. First, everything we owned that had been shipped in wedding presents from Boston and all of our household goods from Fort Hood, Texas, burned to the ground in a fireproof army warehouse. That wasn't enough. Three days later, we were in a hotel, and there was a flash flood between Arlington and Alexandria. It's called Arlandria. And the flash flood got what was left of our possessions in our two cars that we drove across from Fort Hood with packages in them. But that wasn't enough. <laughs> I worked for a month on inventory for the little church that we had. Um, and I went out and bought a few supplies like sheets and, and knives and forks to move into our one room apartment. And it was so loud in the back of our car in Washington, D.C. <laughs> so, with all that excitement and warm welcome to Washington, our insurance company dropped us like a head. <laughs> but I did get involved with the international world there, too. I call it my title of my talk, I don't think too many people know it, it's the title of my talk is Army, Army Life to Embassy Life, Adventures in International Play-In. <laughs> it's, it's a record, but it was, um, it was wonderful. So, so when I got involved again with the International play in Washington, um, they let me be a guide to uh, foreigners that the State Department brought in who visit the United States. My, my, my job was to tour them around Capitol Hill and the House and Senate, the Library of Congress, and the Supreme Court. And it was such an education with all these different nationalities coming in. The one I remember most was the Koreans, the South Koreans, because they always carried in their suit pockets hot pepper flakes. And it was because I learned um, the American food is just so bland. <laughs> well, if any of you have eaten kimchi, and a friend of mine, Lady Sonic, was wonderful. But kimchi, she always used to call it sauerkraut mixed with gunpowder. <laughs> I learned about kimchi a year later. Judging who stood for a hardship to our in the army, which means um, the band is not a company or at least sponsored. But there was just me and I met. And we lived in the New Korea Hotel. The New Korea Hotel was torn down as the old Korea Hotel 20 years later. And I understood that better when we met the, um, the gentleman, the American, who was just going back home to America from uh, Seoul. Um, he had handed out the US AID, aid program. And he told us that um, Korea was taking off economically, and our aid was no longer actually needed. But he said, guess what the number one export of South Korea? This is in 1966. And I don't think anybody will guess except some people who know already. False eyelashes. <laughs> That's the country that's making one guys and sandstones and heavy machinery and sophisticated hospital equipment. When we were in Korea, when we first got there, we stayed in a different hotel, and um, there were all these little children standing outside the door looking for tourists. <clears throat> Pathetic little creatures in rags and their hands out and their arm were broken. I, as I lived in the hotel, I got to know little scamps. <laughs> and sometimes this arm would be broken, and sometimes this arm would be broken. <laughs> And when I would go off to teach school, um, <laughs> they'd wake me in a broken arms and then. <laughs> I did teach school um, in, a, in a fun, fun way, and I know some of you have done this. I taught English as a foreign language to a girls' high school, which is a lot of fun. I don't know if you, any of you ever taught in Korea, but it is so intoxicating because you walk down the hallway and a little girl's curtsy as you go by, the honorable teacher. Then I taught at the Women's Teachers College, same kind of thing, great respect for the teacher. We could use a little of that. And then they gave me the political writers of the 12, 12 newspapers in Seoul. 
And that was such an education because you could ask them anything. I mean, they were just keeping their English conversation going. And I'll never forget, one of, the, one of my students was a distinguished political writer then. He told me that during the world, uh, during the, the invasion of the North Koreans, his parents understood that the North Korean army would be going around hunting for young boys to conscript into their army. His parents hid him under the floor, and he said when he lay there, he could hear the um, footsteps of the boots of the North Koreans walking above him. They never got him. <laughs> After Korea, he had a little chance during his served his hardship tour. Uh, he was allowed to put in a request for the next posting. We ended, ended up in Paris. We had ended up living behind Napoleon's tomb. And Joseph was to be able to see as a military attaché. And this was the time not only of the Cold War, which meant they were out every single night because of the receptions of the 150 military attaches posted in Paris then. And they all had their National Day like our Fourth of July. And they also had their Armed Forces Day. So it was a lot of the night business. But it was also during Vietnam peace talks. And um, General Walters was Joseph's boss. He was the defense attaché. Almost nobody knows him in this country. Everybody knew him in Europe. And spoke nine languages. He became ambassador to West Germany. He predicted the fall of the Berlin Wall. He just was very um, knowledgeable. He was a national treasure. Walters was asked to put up our Secretary of State every weekend for two years in secret. And it was Henry Kissinger. So Kissinger would get a photograph taken of him with some scarlet on Friday night. Next day, it was in the Washington Post. There's Henry Kissinger with his scarlet. Meanwhile, he was in Paris, staying in Walters' apartment in Cognito. And he would go and negotiate with the North Vietnamese uh, ambassador, Nito Tho. And um, there was a wonderful story which I can't resist telling. Walters got a call one night when he was at a dinner party, and he disappeared. And it turned out that he had told the government that the French intelligence was too good to try to hide Kissinger. So they knew, and as the French president, Poppy didn't know. And so when Walter got this emergent call that said, um, Henry Kissinger's airplane cannot let Paris. It has to go into Germany to our one of our bases. And um, 10 minutes later, he was in the French president's plane, <laughs> him, picking up a meek and quiet Kissinger. And they came back, and then Walter, who knew his way around Europe, said, you know, we've broken French airspace, a German airspace. Um, we had heard the French president's plane. There's going to be a little suspicion. We better have a cover story. So they caught that. They, they put back this, it was an affair of a lady. <laughs> Total understanding. And that was the time for about three or four days. Walters was in a, uh, one of the many recessions, and he saw the German attaché winding his way through the crowd. And he sidled up to General Walters and he said, Morgan, um, I think you owe us, I hope you owe Germany an explanation. Um, he broke German airspace. You were in the French president's plane. Um, I think you should tell me what was going on. And Walter sidled up in a very confidential manner and said, it was an affair of a lady. Couple understanding for 30 seconds. And then the German came back on him. And he said, we'll get it out. I have one question. And Walter still got his sweat bullets. Um, this French president's lady, was she German or was she French? Now, we ended up going back to, after some wonderful years in Paris, we ended up going out to, um, to Iowa. And in Iowa, you get involved in politics, and we did. And 
they learned how to work with caucuses. Now I understand how to work with primaries. But um, we also got involved in going to lock and lock and in. And we ended up, how many of you the been to see PACs? A few of you. Hi. Berlin, everybody, if you've ever had a chance to know this, it's fabulous. We went to a seven of the eight ones that Ronald Reagan uh, spoke to. And it was pretty heavy stuff back in the books in the 60s. Because we, we thought we were the only conservatives on earth, and here was a whole room full of 400. Today there are like 10,000 that show up. But we also got involved in, um, in uh, presidential delegations. We got sent on two presidential delegations. One was in the 70s to go to Madagascar. You know Madagascar off the coast of Africa, the great giant island. And we wish to celebrate the 20th anniversary of their glorious socialist revolution. But our delegation was headed up by an Iowa a senator by the name of Roger Jetson. And um, Roger was heavily, heavily lobbied by the president and prime minister of Madagascar because there was a great problem in Madagascar. Coca-Cola had changed their recipe and they stopped using Vanilla is from Madagascar, and this was a national tragedy. Well, I know Coca-Cola did change um, back to the real vanilla beans, and I'd like to think that Roger Jackson was partly responsible. The other presidential delegation was, do you all remember UNESCO, United Nations Education, Cultural, and Social Educational? Anyway, we were sent for a month long uh, delegation, both me and Joseph, um, for, in Paris. And every day we would be in, involved with all these other nationalities uh, in the big room, um, talking policy, I guess. But one day I came back to our delegation's hotel, and there was a message from somebody called, um, what is his name? He was the deputy to, uh, to uh, the deputy campaign manager for Reagan, Ed Rollins. You'll see him on television once in a while because he's helping support uh, President Trump. By the way, I love what Jody said about her, uh, this wonderful president that we've got, and I love what Carrie said about community protection and um, guidance. Anyway, back, back to this, uh, this message from Ed Rollins, and it was actually for me. And he wanted to know whether he'd like to be the um, female co-chairman for the um, Reagan Bush campaign in 1984 for Iowa. I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Joseph and I moved down. We spent a whole year working our heels off in the um, in Des Moines, staying in a little tiny hotel where we were again. And um, a year later, he got a call. Oh, no, two years later. He, well, two years later, we ended up in the local office. And Robert Reagan was saying goodbye to his newly minted ambassador to the United Nations in Geneva and the other international organizations to which he was accredited. accredited. And imagine yourself having had this lifelong dream of being a wife. What's it like? want to be the ambassador? was one step up. I wanted to be the ambassador's wife. <laughs> and there I was in oh this, this woman with a dream come true and it was actually happening, which I thought never could be. And I was standing beside the two men I most admire and respect on this earth. And what was I thinking? Women. <laughs> I was so worried about my hair. <laughs> I have ovarian cancer chemotherapy and I was bald. And I have a nice heavy blonde wig, which matched what I once had been. And I was so afraid that it would go askew. <laughs> it didn't. And we on the plane, and the wig went for good into a duffel bag. And all the time we were in Geneva, I had short, black, curly hair. It happened to sideways. Now, I just want to say a little bit about life as an ambassador's wife in Geneva. The two, the two sort of highlights were the people that we worked with. 
there were the international organizations, of which there were several dozen located in Geneva Tunnel with great skyscraper buildings. And the other was the 129 countries that were represented in Geneva. Today they're like 92, something like that. Um, but I just want to tell about four of the international organizations and four of the um, diplomats that we brought shoulders with, which made Geneva just the anything I could have dreamed of as a child. The first one was international, uh, four international organizations. You all heard of the WHO, World Health Organization. And they're working on nieces at the moment, I think. But in my day, this would have been in 1987, we had to make our, our courtesy calls, protocol calls on these various uh, directors general of the international organizations. And the WHO, which was headed by a very distinguished Dane, and he was very proud to tell us that smallpox had been eradicated from this earth. I, I, you probably all knew that, but in 1988 we didn't. And um, he said that, that he took a lot of credit for WHO. I think probably was deserved. But I remember having smallpox shots. I bet some of you do when you were little. Um, but he also told us with great pride that they had he and his staff had gone around to some 2,000 rooms of the WHO building headquarters, breaking ashtrays. They got the message across that ashtrays are not good, smoking not good. Uh, but that was only his way of doing it. The second international organization that we um, that we made a call to was the uh, ILO, the International Labor Office, and um, that was headed up by a very distinguished um, Frenchman whose wife was very active in the UN uh, Women's Guild, and those ladies would put on a bazaar with 129 pounds food and wares and they did thing. But um, we had. Part of Joseph's work was handling American delegations that would come in for these various international organizations' conferences. And we have a lady head up of uh, the international, uh, the American delegation for the uh, labor, the Secretary of Labor. And she came in to give us, um, be the guest of honor at a reception that we gave <laughs> in, our, in our little, um, in our tent outside our little living room. Just as we were leaving, Joseph pulled out a magazine, a small magazine out of the pocket, and he handed it and said, Mr. Director General, if you ever have really trouble figuring out the weather of the world, you just consult this. It was all of our And I want to touch briefly on four of the more interesting, well, they were all fascinating ambassadors, but four of them were my favorites. Um, one was Top Gay Dorje and his wife. He was the ambassador from Bhutan out in the Himalayas. Top Gay's wife, Yen Singh, had stomped her little foot in front of her daddy when she was six, and she said she wanted to be educated. You didn't do that in Bhutan in those days. But Daddy was a pussycat, and pretty soon Jensen was on horseback with a mounted guard um, for a two week ride into India, where she spent seven years without seeing her family. And then she came back uh, to Bhutan, and I don't know how much later, but she married the king's son. The second one was um, the, the Russian. The Russian ambassador, uh, Evgeny Makaya, his wife's name was Leniana, as in Lenin. Uh, Makaya and his wife were both hardcore communists, um, but he was a grandpa, and he and I had some really nifty conversations about his grandchildren on the human level. The third one was. Um, let me see. Now let's get the third one. The fourth one was um, the Finn, the Finnish ambassador, Oli Menander. And Oli had a bunch of us over to his house for dinner, and they did. Um, and we went into the living room after 
afterwards, and the investment back to their children's lives. And we ended up jokes. Not any kind of jokes. The jokes were all about Cal Coolidge. <laughs> now here we are in the middle of Geneva with a dozen different nationalities present. And they were telling them Cal Coolidge jokes. <laughs> And my favorite one was, I mean, maybe some of you know this, but Cal was campaigning in Vermont. Uh, and somebody in the balcony yelled out, Come on, you know Cal, well, take love. Cal didn't miss a beat. Oh, tell them all we both know, and it won't take any longer. <laughs> well, pretty soon we finished our, we had our third, July party out at the uh, gardens of our residence, and I should judge it, I should who has some hands. But soon we were on our way back to America, and we had, had decided that we would become dementorites, something that I'm so happy we did. <laughs> so we came back and settled in Dublin and um, got a little bit involved in politics. And that's one of the best people I think we did. Whether it was Sons of Kings or beggars in the outside of hotel, it was some of the best people we've ever met. Actually, through politics and adventure. And I dare say that a lot of you may share my feelings on that. In closing, I'd just like to say take advantage of my 82 years and look back to the road of life. And there are two little magic recipes for living that I pick up along the way. Um, Greg Parks has Politics is down the road from culture. Well, these are two. One was written and one was sung. The first one that was written goes back to the Reader's Digest back in the 50s. There was a, um, an old lady who uh, wrote her story. It was called Pushing by Gratitude. And um, the idea was that she was going into a nursing home, but she decided she was going to love it and she was great, so grateful for so many other things. And actually, I do think gratitude is one of the secrets to happiness. Um, and it can get you through a lot of sort of house fires or cancer or anything like that. The other one goes back to a song, and I remember if any of you are old enough to remember, it was in the 50s, and it was at the top of the hit grade all summer long. And it was called Nature Boy. Very wise was he, and though he spoke of many things, fools and kings, this he said to me, the greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return.